안녕하세요. 코트라 사회적 가치실의 이정상 실장입니다. 세션2 모더레이터와 패널 연사님께 질문드립니다. 넥스트 노멀 시대는 아시아 지역의 임팩트 생태계에 어떤 변화가 올지 그리고 그 변화 속에서 한국의 임팩트 생태계 플레이어의 역할은 무엇이고 아시아 임팩트 생태계 플레이어와 함께 컬렉티브 임팩트를 강화할 수 있는 방법은 무엇이 있을까요? 2. My name is Anna Kang. Uh, I'm a manager at ABPN, uh, ABGM Venture f l a n t h r o p y South Korea representative, and I'm a senior consultant at Mary Year Social Company. Uh, welcome to the session two. So we will be discussing the future of Asian impact ecosystem for the next new normal this time. So in the face of COVID-19, uh, social impact ecosystem players are facing unprecedented situation. Uh, where we all are required to adapt uh, rapidly to the changes and also we have to work collectively uh, to meet the social needs. So here we have uh, amazing four panelists from different sectors. Uh, they are representing corporation and foundation and impact investor and ecosystem builder. So all here, we are together uh, here to share insights and, and discuss how we can better cope with and, and how we can better prepare and transform for the next new normal uh, from the perspective of collective impact. So uh, we have uh, Christy, Christy Davis from uh, Executive Director of l e a n Center for Social Innovation Singapore Management University and k w a n g Kim from Korea Foundation and j e h o Che from uh, <coughs> Hyundai Water Groups and then we have uh, Gyeong Sun Chan from HG Initiative. So uh, dear panelists, could you start uh, the brief introduction to the audience starting from Christy? Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you can hear me okay. Greetings from Singapore. It's a, a beautiful sunny day. My name is Christy Davis. I am dialing in from Singapore Management University's l e a n Center for Social Innovation. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Thank you for joining us from all the way from Singapore. Yeah. And next, k w a n g could you introduce yourself? Good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Kwang Kim. I'm the country representative for the Asia Foundation here in Korea. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Yes, Jeho, please. Yeah, thank you for having me here today. My name is Jeho Choi. I'm working for Hyundai Motor Group as a CSR manager. Uh, I hope that this will be a good opportunity to understand each other from corporate and nonprofit. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kyung Sun Chung from HEG Initiative, and I'm also Chief Imagination Officer of the Root Impact. It's uh, I'm a uh, great pleasure to be here, mm -hmm. and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. So before the panel discussion, we'll be uh, starting uh, the brief uh, presentation for each panelist. So each panelist will share their insights and what their organizations are doing and what the ecosystem players are working for the Uh, collective impact uh, for the next new normal. So starting from Christy and, and, and Kwang and myself, we were sharing the Pan-Asia perspectives. And then uh, Jeho Choi and k y u n g s u n will share their insights as an organization based in Korea, but uh, also a plan to actively implement the collective impact uh, abroad. So shall we start from Christy? Uh, Christy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone out there. I'm just kind of pretending that I can see all of you. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to, to be here and represent um, 
you know, just the, the, just kind of, uh, I guess the perspective of what we can see from here in our vantage point on the ecosystem for social innovation and social impact. So Anna, I'm presuming that my slides are being shown. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Wonderful. So I'm on the, uh, the slide where the, there's the photograph of our campus and just going to be looking um, briefly at four dimensions today. So let's just carry on. And um, I think I'll just move uh, for the sake of time, I'll move uh, right into the next slide and look at um, just kind of consider these different aspects and how they align with a collective impact model as a framework for community change and impact uh, during this pandemic time and how does an ecosystem uh, adapt and evolve, um, especially at times like this. So the first act uh, aspect, what is the current state of the social innovation ecosystem? I mean, obviously that's a huge topic. Uh, we could spend a day um, just on this topic alone, but uh, allow me to highlight just three observations as a conversation starter for today. So first, we're seeing an increase of collaboration and intentionality to connect across networks. And when I say networks, I mean, uh, it could be different uh, public private sector, it could be uh, NGO sector, social, social service organizations. It's really different dimensions of society as a whole. Um, a quick example, I've got a number of examples on these slides. I'm just going to highlight one per slide. And if anyone has interest um, on the others, just if you, you can Google it or just follow with me later, I'll be happy to share more examples. But uh, the Impact Collective and TBN Asia are both networks and communities, both as organizations to support great imp impact ideas that can solve uh, social, economic and environmental issues in Asia, but not only through investment and funding, but by sharing and developing uh, meaningful relationships and solutions and creating new networks and connecting people together uh, within those communities. A second, there continues to be a consistent, some consistent growth in social and purpose-driven businesses uh, in spite of the pandemic hardship. We actually are seeing growth in social enterprises. Uh, these are the entrepreneurs and the businesses uh, that are being supported in part by communities and networks such as Impact Collective and TB in Asia uh, to help them uh, develop and move through these times. And third, there's an increase of collaboration and social innovation conversations popping up in new and unexpected places. Um, um, had some very interesting experiences over the last six months with this. Um, just two, uh, I'll cite really quickly, uh, with two very different forms just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, one was a leadership summit convened by Bank Indonesia. Um, and a second was a disaster management forum hosted by the ASEAN Humanitarian Center. What was interesting is that both of these, uh, these, these discussions um, focused on the power of working together for collective impact in their respective spaces. So I thought that was just a really good sign. Uh, next, please. So let's look at a few of the trends gaining momentum. Uh, first, the promotion and support of social entrepreneurship is definitely picking up speed. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, we're seeing new enterprises as in support of them uh, tackling challenges across all the dimensions. So that's fintech, technology, health and wellness, education, food. Food Bank Singapore, uh, as an example, was busier than ever uh, during the past six months and is really creatively partnering with other actors, both old and new to their ecosystem. So traditionally like FNB or community centers, corporations, but also like they're partnering with a vending machine company uh, to get more nutritious food options into the hands of families who need it. And their partnerships with the F&B uh, companies are really looking at how to minimize food waste. So instead of tossing food out, they get it into the hands of people who need it. Um, investing is on the rise. Um, AVPN, um, Anna giving you a plug. It's a wonderful network that supports this community. And I know we'll hear more about that. So I won't go into more information, uh, more, more, any more uh, comment on that here. And then finally, you may wonder what Animal Crossing is doing here. I don't know if you know um, Animal Crossing, um, but it's a social simulation video game series. Um, and it's playing an unusual role in helping people connect in both personal and strategic ways. Uh, so for example, I have a good friend of mine and she was, uh, she's Muslim and she was telling me that this year during Ramadan, uh, many Muslims around the world missed out uh, from one of the most important traditions, which is breaking fast with each other. Um, so some people took to Animal Crossing to hold 
um, the evening break fast meal um, on their uh, Animal Crossing islands. Um, so it's it's really interesting how different platforms are are coming into play to bring people together and to connect people. Uh, the next, please. So the third um, dimension is changing needs. So our needs are changing, obviously, because of these unusual times. I mean, COVID's turned us all upside down. Um, some people are really struggling and others have adapted and pivoted very quickly. And I just think that's wonderful for, for everyone um, in the region. Uh, so we're seeing a re a, an increase in a response to needs. Um, we're seeing uh, an increase in cross-border networks. Um, and we're seeing a uh, speed of connection increase so that there's, there's, it's facilitating quicker problem solving, the way people are connecting across new, not only networks, but borders um, and with new uh, and sectors. Uh, so much of this, interestingly, is informal. Uh, technology is obviously, you know, obviously facilitating a lot of connecting, you know, like all Animal Farm and others. Um, um, but there's other ways that those who might otherwise be left out are being reached. So Dana, for example, it's a fintech company. Uh, I think it's the third largest wallet in Indonesia. And they're delivering inclusive financial services to the whole of Indonesia. And they're focused on reaching women in very rural areas. So they've stepped up their efforts and are working um, collectively with new actors and stakeholders to reach uh, folks that otherwise people that would otherwise not be be reached. And then finally, something that's very close to my heart, um, and it's a key value uh, to innovate, grow, and thrive, and that's to be generative in spirit um, and in resources. Uh, so you may think, you know, why am I talking about this with, with collective action? But actually, I think being generative and generous is actually an underlying value that will that is required as a prerequisite for collective impact to, to work, truly work. Um, I think generosity is a virtue of giving great things to others freely, abundantly, um, but it's also a paradox. You know, the more you give, uh, the more I believe you receive in return. So it's, it's a win-win. Uh, it also means being proactive and intentional to reach out across traditional borders and sectors to partner with people not like yourself, not like, like, like ourselves, but also in a, um, always in a spirit of mutual benefit and pooling on strengths and, and pooling strengths for a multiplier effect and looking at net value for all. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, there's creative collaboration that's compelled action from people that we might not um, have otherwise engaged. So I'm sure uh, someone that all of you there in South Korea will know very well, I presume, the BTS Army boy band. Um, and it's amazing how they've inspired their legions of fans to do all kinds of good, not just in South Korea, um, but across the region. There's so much going on here in Singapore, for example, and it's all of these BTS Army boy band fans. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So finally, um, here in Singapore, there's a number of ground up initiatives that have sprung to help foreign workers who've been affected um, by the Sing by Singapore's by our uh, circuit breaker, our lockdown here. Um, and there's there's a number of those, but I think from that that uh, that experience of, of of the communities rising up to help the migrant worker population, what was interesting is one of our former um, parliament members of parliament said. If there's a silver lining of COVID-19, of this pandemic, it is that things that were, were, that were once invisible are now visible, which allows us then to, to see them and grasp them and to do something about it. So many of these examples um, I've shared, uh, they do follow um, a full collective impact model, but a lot of them are startup responses to an urgent situation like the pandemic, which may not live beyond it. But I think both of these, all of these examples are, are elements of a, a vibrant and healthy social impact ecosystem in, in, in Asia. So I'll look forward to, to talking about it more after we hear the other, my fellow panelists present. So thank you so much. Thank you, Christy, for sharing insightful cases. So shall we move on to Kwang? Thank you. Uh, it was great to hear that, Christy, again. Um, and. I wanted to just to start by the, the main theme of the conference, the word Asia, because it resonates um, the presence of the Asia Foundation in 18 countries. So we're very dedicated and committed to, to Asia, serving Asia, uh, and impact. Uh, we're committed to make an impact to individuals and, and lives, uh, as well as the ecosystem. So it's not just um, individually, but also we want to see, we seek to uh, we seek uh, systemic changes 
Um, so we're very excited to be part of this of this conference. Um, I come up from a background where uh, with this stakeholder collective management and, and results and impact uh, was almost like second nature. I was part of uh, Professor Michael Porter in Harvard Business School uh, team of um, that advise governments and companies on economic clusters around the world, uh, how to um, mobilize a, a multi-stakeholder process involving companies, government, civil society, and academia uh, in countries like Rwanda post after the genocide um, in, in 2000, in, 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 I'm sorry, 1990s, but we started the work uh, in, in early 2000s. Also in Afghanistan, in Jamaica, the, the, um, in Caribbean islands. Uh, so it's a very exciting that those type of approaches have crossed over now into different forms. Um, I wanted to share with you uh, a little bit about some of the work that the Asia Foundation is doing in Asia on this, using a similar uh, collective impact approach. Uh, one is the uh, Coalitions for Change. It's, we've been very active using a, a multi-stakeholder process in the Philippines. And for example, on disaster risk management, uh, as, a, as a responding to disasters, uh, especially at the local level where there are lack of resources, um, where even though that's where the disasters happen, uh, we mobilized a multi-stakeholder coalition of government, private sector, NGOs, and so forth. Uh, and uh, we were able to uh, dramatically increase the funding um, through all the projects um, that, that are needed in the, uh, in the, in, in, in the uh, decentralized regions of the Philippines. So that's, we have also had a case on tobacco uh, and using tobacco tax to fund health programs in the Philippines. Um, so one of the key ingredients about principles of um, this multi-stakeholder pro uh, process coalition for change is the following. One, start, then specifics emerge versus pre-setting and pre-planning. So it's often it takes forever to plan. And our point is, no, get it started. It doesn't mean that you're, uh, you're, you're, you're compromising quality, but let's get started. Uh, small bets, learning by doing versus analysis. Expect and exploit surprises instead, instead of minimizing unexpected outcomes, so not to be too risk adverse. Uh, influence future with action. Um, and focus on behavior of leaders. What type of leaders do you want to work with? Uh, one is greed, confidence, humility, and autonomy. So those are the qualities. Uh, so the coalition for change is one, is one um, approach, but the second approach that we're using is corporate engagement. So the Asia Foundation has been collaborating with the Mars Corporation on a cutting edge movement called the Economics of Mutuality. Uh, and in the Philippines, for example, uh, we work with micro retailers uh, to in the slums and, and in, in slums of, of, of Manila uh, that focuses on developing a business model that focuses beyond profits. So instead of incentivizing micro retailers with with uh, with profits, we ask them to maximize social capital. So if they increase social capital, we will reward them separately. We have two control group, one with normal rewards and another with social capital. And interestingly, the retailers that focus on social capital had more revenues at the end of the year. Uh, so if you had more collective action programs, for example, so the retailers themselves started to uh, engage in multi-stakeholder process to, so that they can achieve social capital. Um, so it's engaging companies uh, to through this uh, economic mutuality, uh, we also had a case of DBS, a bank in Singapore, where they are focused on issues such as uh, food um, uh, food waste. Uh, so we identify major problems in society and get a multi-stakeholder coalition that addresses them. Uh, so the key features of EOM is purpose and meaningfully challenge to so identify the problem clearly. The second is ecosystem orchestration, orchestrating the ecosystem, and new capital metrics and accounting that focus on people, profit, and planet. Um, so happy to share more about that uh, with the, the Asia Foundation and EON collaboration. 
we're looking for opportunities in Korea and Asia uh, because what NGOs are good at are social license to operate. So uh, that's a comparative advantage that foundations have like us where we can uh, create a license for this initiative to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kwang, for sharing your cases. Uh, from now on, I'm going to uh, share my presentation um, for five minutes. And so I'm going to talk about the uh, power of networks to foster collective impact here. Uh, so representing Asian venture philanthropy again. So, uh, so, so many of you already know uh, so the, the importance of the providing financial and non-financial capital to, to social impact uh, sectors. Uh, it has, has uh, very uh, high uh, in Asia over the past decades. But at the same time, we have seen a big financing gap to address complex impact issues. And also there's a growing concentration of wealth. And but at the same time, we still see uh, there's a lack of, um, you know, lack of uh, enabling environments. So here, uh, that's why uh, ABPN exists. So ABPN is the largest social investors network in Asia. We are representing 600, uh, over 600 organizations across Asia, and they're all from different uh, regions and different sectors. So as a leading ecosystem builder, so we think that we need to in, uh, emphasize on, on to increasing the flow of capital and trying to ensure uh, the all the resources are deployed effectively. So we are currently uh, headquartered in Singapore, and, and there's uh, 13 different market uh, reps in, in APPN. So our, our members are actually representing uh, the full diversity in the capital spectrum. They're ranging from corporation and foundation and family offices and impact fund and incubator and accelerators and universities and, and so on. So our role here, the ABPN, is uh, to break the silo between these different organizations and we're focusing on, on maximizing collecting, collective impact among these different um, organizations. So we try to embrace all different types of social investor investment capital, including uh, intellectual, human, and financial capital, all towards to, to create maximum social impact. So as you can see, uh, the uh, collective action and collective impact are, are deeply embedded in the, the nature of ABPN. The ABPN's uh, its uh, strategy and and the direction and identity, I think it's called align, all aligned with the collective impact uh, concept. So what we're doing here is that we provide uh, a different types of uh, services for our members and, uh, and we provide largest uh, convenings and conferences for our social investors and, and impact ecosystem players uh, every year. And also we provide uh, capacity building programs and also uh, insights uh, through our knowledge center in ABPN Academy and policy forums. And also we're trying to link the research providers and social investors and to connect the, with the uh, right and investable and impactful uh, impact startups and nonprofits. And here, uh, we think that uh, based on our, our experiences and work, I think that it's quite, uh, we want to share some of the key tips uh, how to use the networks and community to harness the collective impact. I think uh, uh, first one is uh, to finding out the right and very uh, capable, reliable backbone organization is very important uh, for the success of uh, collective impact. So uh, through this type of a community and, and the networks, actually you can find out the uh, right and, and very um, a suitable partner for you. So here, uh, ABPN, we try to showcase as much as good cases and bad cases as well to, to, uh, for our members to learn from them each other. And also, uh, we, to, do that, to do that, uh, we strongly encourage you to be an active advocate for, cut for the causes that you care the most. And also, we encourage you to share your success stories within the community. By doing so, you can actually stay updated uh, and also you can share your knowledge and you can have a regular conversation with the uh, fellow impact uh, ecosystem builders. And so I think uh, that's really uh, good to, you know, 
maximize your collective impact. Also, uh, you know, work with uh, totally different com you know, com companies or organizations are much you know, necessary because most unlikely organizations can actually uh, contribute to your collective impact. So we strongly encourage you to, to meet different organizations. And also last but not least, we also um, you know, encourage, hope to encourage you to contribute yourself to the community because um, by doing so, actually, you could be more equipped and prepared um, for uh, you know, designing better collective impact initiative and to you know, implement a better uh, improved uh, impact collective initiative for sure. So here, uh, with, together with members, we created and have been formulating different types of platforms around uh, different thematic issues like gender, COVID-19, and climate action. So here, what we do is we're trying to uh, help uh, our, our members to meet together and connect with one another to, to actually you know, do something together. They can do the project or they can do, you know, exchange knowledge and find a right, you know, right partner there. And also, we you know, initiated the ABPN Constellation uh, 2020. This is to recognize and showcase the best practice of collective impact projects among our members. But that's uh, what we've done. And uh, this is uh, my last slide. And we have uh, 17 Korean members in Asia. So they are working very closely together and collectively. So I just want to give you a few examples. So Korea Social and Solidarity Foundation, they actually formulate this the All Together Crisis Response Fund to, to provide you know, support and financial uh, support to the social enterprise damaged by COVID-19. So all the organizations are members listed here, Impact Fund and Ecosystem Builder, they actually join this movement and as a funder. Also, Hanang University and Korea National Council on Social Welfare, of course, they actually mobilized this type of wonderful conference to promote collective impact in Korea. So I think this is a wonderful initiative. Thank you for that. And last but not least, Pan Impact Korea, though, which is a social impact fund operator in Korea. So they complete, you know, recently completed successfully their first um, social impact fund in Asia. Then right now, uh, vigorously, you know, they are designing and then trying to implement a social impact fund in Korea and lots of different sectors. So uh, these are uh, some of the you know examples and cases and insights that I, I want to share today. And thank you for listening. And I welcome you to all uh, visit ABPN website and to see more of our activities and opportunities you can, you can get here. Thank you for your listening. So, um, so we so far we have dealt with the uh, you know Pan Asian perspective. So from now on, so let's move on to Jeho. So Jeho, uh, as a you know leading Korean corporations in Korea, so could you share uh, the what have done so far? Uh, your, on your side. Okay, my name is Jeho Choi. I'm a CSR manager with Hyundai Motor Group. Uh, I totally agree that what Erin Lee told us in this morning that. Uh, the successful collective impact needs an endless effort of each participant. Actually, at first, uh, we started not knowing what is a collective impact, and I don't know whether our story, our H Jump School, is the right case of a collective impact, but thanks to the opportunity given to me today, I'd like to share with you what we felt when we are carrying out the H Jump School Vietnam project. As uh, the collective impact concept published in the 2011 Stanford Social Innovation Review uh, very much has inspired us. So Hyundai Motor Group also has a similar concept such as collaboration, partnership, and cooperation. Uh, you are able to see in our CSR story this kind of a philosophy. When we started the H Jump School Vietnam project, uh, we knew that the importance of a collaboration with the partners to create more great impact, but uh, we didn't know that whether it is collective impact or not. Then, uh, let me first tell you why we chose um, Vietnam as our destination. As you can see here, Hyundai was the number one car maker in Vietnam in the first half of 2020. As the top car maker in Vietnam market, we should do something for Vietnamese society. And you found that one of the biggest social problems is education inequality in Vietnam. So to solve this problem, uh, we started to think that 
what kind of CSR project would be best for Vietnam society? And the answer was H Jump School that has been making a successful collective impact for the last seven years in Korea. H Jump School Vietnam began with the MOU ceremony between Hyundai Motor Company and Korean NGO Jump and Vietnam National University and Vietnam NGO VPV in the July 20th. According to the MOU, over the three years, we will post 150 Vietnamese college student teachers and we will provide educational support to 1,000 unprivileged children in Vietnam. Uh, to do that, Hyundai Motor will donate 450 million won and we expect that the social value will be reach up to 2 billion won after three years. In addition, I believe that we would create a virtuous cycle model. Uh, college teachers and beneficiaries and professional mentors are growing together with uh, this platform. Uh, so we analyzed our H Jump School partnership in accordance with the five conditions of collective impact. First, the common agenda. Hyundai Motor, Motor Group and NGO Jump and VPV and Vietnam National University had a common agenda, reducing the educational inequality problem and fostering university students leaders in Vietnam society. Uh, second, the shared measurement system. We have a common performance measurement system, including academic performance of a beneficiary student and altruism and future employment rate for college teachers. And third, mutual reinforcing activities. We have a clear share of roles for each partners, as you can see in this slide. Fourth, continuous communication. We constantly communicate with our partners, such as regular meeting and the horizontal feedback systems. Fifth, the backbone support organization. This is most important. The JUMP, which has 10 years of experience in solving the educational inequality problem in Korea, has coordinated and communicated the entire project successfully. If you see in this way, uh, it seems like that our project is the best answer of collective impact, but there have been a number of trial and error in this process. Uh, our project wouldn't be possible without the trust and empathy and intimacy among each partners. So I'd like to talk it about later in the, at the Q&A session, and this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeho, for sharing your awesome initiative. Uh, and last but not least, Kyung San from HG Initiative will share uh, their insights. Thank you. Uh, I think my time is already up, but I'll try my best to be concise. Uh, so I spent a lot of last seven and eight years in uh, building a social impact ecosystem in Song Sudong area. And I believe it was uh, ideal in terms of showing that what collective impact should look like because as on uh, social ventures and social enterprises and philanthropic organization all in Song Sudong neighborhood, we believe that it, is, it was really important to have a successful ecosystem for us to thrive. So we had the common agenda. And in terms of uh, the measurements, I think we were still trying to do that. And that's why we, uh, we created something called the Impact Alliance to have like con a con continual conversation on how we should uh, measure our impact, how we should our measure our impact, and how we should work together. So that also allowed us for the continuous conversations. And also that really led to sort of the mutual reinforcing, because I, I think like once we have the successful ecosystem, I think it was helping our organizations to be much more impact, impactful and uh, successful and then and then we were able to attract more resources and more participants into our ecosystem as well and uh, I think the root impact was serving the role of uh, really the backbone organizations and it was ideal oh sorry it was ideal because we believed um, 
it was more of a really grassroots that everyone is par participating equally. It was not like like we were the like leading organization and everyone was following us. Like we and also um, um, cow and dog and, and like all these other uh, the people we work together to create this very uh, equal ecosystem where everyone provide the feedbacks and when everyone can participate to create the change within ourselves. So for the social impact ecosystem, I think we've been doing well. And so that's why, like for now, as an uh, chairman of the HGI, like something I'm looking at right now is uh, we s strongly believe there could be much more collective impact between the larger corporations and the social impact sector. Because as we all know, like I think the Hyundai Motor is really one of the greatest ex example. A lot of large corporations, they are in the middle of what we call the impact transformation. Now they are, they are trying to be much more impactful and uh, socially environmentally conscious. And like they could really have a lot of synergy between the social impact organizations. And I think that's one of the role you're serving in. And but like there are some large corporations who's already doing that well, but there are large corporations who is sort of having a hard time doing that because I think the language we are speaking, the social innovation organizations and large corporation is a little bit different. So that's why now HGI is creating something called uh, the Sustainable Future Alliance. We are trying to be common ground between the larger corporations and social impact uh, or organizations so they can have much more e uh, effective and efficient collaboration between two of them. In order to do this, uh, actually we were doing some of the role here. I guess I guess we are trying to be the backbone organization for this uh, communication between these two sectors that we are investing a lot into uh, the the researches and academic data and uh, like what it, like how should you measure the impact for larger corporations and how can you actually help them to implement some of this social innovation idea into their like large business models. I think we need to have this kind of um, cornerstone work before we actually start conversation. Um, I think there's going to be a lot, actually a lot of people are interested in this because as I mentioned before, like all those big challenges we are facing such as like climate change or the pandemics and all that, not there's no single entity who can solve everything. So it will require like most optimized collective impact work from everyone else. But in order to do that, we basically need to understand how to work with each other. And I think we it's really time for us to put an effort to create basically that kind of the working process to how can you be actually, uh, actually much more collective with other people. Thank you. Thank you very much for your timely uh, presentation. Um, yeah, thank you all for, uh, for sharing your like stories and cases. I think uh, it's pretty much, I think, very approval because you bring all the different perspectives from different sectors and, and different cases. I think uh, it's really good. And so sh let's move on to the like uh, panel discussion from now on. And so as uh, we are the Asian impact uh, ecosystem builder, right? So we are all based in Asia and I mean, during the keynote speech, uh, Eric mentioned that, uh, that this uh, collective impact concept is actually uh, starting from the uh, United States and the concept uh, should be tailored to the local context and the local culture, right? So as uh, Asian ecosystem builder and players, I just want to ask you, and how should we uh, tailor this uh, collective impact to the local context, like Asian context? So, so I'd like to just ask my first question to Kwang. Uh, so since Kwang, you have been uh, such a diverse background working in different regions, especially you worked in uh, for a long time in Latin America and, and also uh, you know, uh, engaged with consultants in, in Pakistan. And now you have been working in as a Korea, you know, country representative of Asia Foundation for two years. And I just want to ask you, like, do you feel the difference between like other countries in Asia, uh, you know, in terms of its collective impact approach, you know, in terms of the outcomes approach? And, and I just want to ask you, is it different or should it be different? Or um, also, uh, what would be the you know, most important factor in terms of the Asian collective impact? Thank you. That's a very good an interesting question. Uh, when I let me answer by sharing what I thought the Asian collective impact process was like, specifically Korea, but also beyond. Uh, when I came here, what I what I I think obviously there is more deference to protocols, 
So you have to think about protocols more. Um, and I also thought that it would be difficult to engage people to participate and, and share openly. It's a, such a big uh, losing face, shame, shame and so forth. So you're very, very careful about what you say and what you say it has to be a bit scripted. Um, and also heard that the collective impact initiatives in Korea, they're very challenging. Uh, and anybody who has been involved, um, especially, and this is true in, in other places too, but the, the critical issue of translation, translating what one group says to the other. So it's often very difficult, it's, even though everybody speaks the same language, Korean or, um, or another language, or Chinese or Japanese, it's they don't, one group of NGOs, when you talk the word equity, for example, it happens a lot. Uh, financial institution will think about equity as having an equity in a firm, like that's a financial term. But if you talk to a social activists or government, it's equality, is it's in, it's addressing inequality and inclusion. So uh, we often have this issue of translation and this, there's a lot of issues uh, with that. But what I found in practice, we just launched a new initiative to bring together impact investors and investors. If you have the right people in the room, uh, people get really excited and worked out. And I think it's very possible. Uh, it's very possible. And, um, and I think the principles of, of collective impact, of finding the right leaders and uh, to work with, I think that they still apply. Thank you for pointing oh, out that. Sorry, one more thing. I, I think we do need some type of a survey uh, and, or an event where we will gather those views. I mean, these are my impressions. I don't think this is universal. We do need some type of a, uh, an effort, and that's something that we would be happy to participate uh, in, in gathering those views from Asia uh, on what is, get empirical data on what people think. Thank you so much. So you mentioned that uh, you know identifying and mobilizing white people are the very uh, important and key to success uh, for you know collective impact in Asia. Uh, I think my uh, similar questions will go to Christy. I think uh, Christy, you are originally from United States, but you over the you know almost like thirty years, right? Past thirty years, you are you know living in different countries, and I think four countries, right? And I think you have such a diverse background. I think more than myself, I think, even I'm an Asian. So I just want to ask the same question. Like, do you, uh, what do you think the, the, the feature of Asian collective impact uh, you know, compared to other, you know, collective impact initiatives in other countries? And also, I'd like to just ask, uh, you know, follow on question that is, I think uh, we have a five conditions of collective impact. But I think it's more like, a, you know, sometimes I consider it's like an output because it's very hard to achieve and obtain, right? Mm. So I just want to ask you, because you are uh, such a, you know, um, diverse background, engaging with different social innovation projects with different, you know, uh, collaboration uh, collaborators. So I just want to ask, uh, what would be the, you know, enablers and what do we have mm. to, uh, you know, build? Uh, uh, build I mean, for the you know, enabling environments for, to achieve these uh, five conditions for collective mm -hmm. impact. Yeah, it's such an interesting question. So I will say it's, it's hard for me to compare in a sense because I've actually not worked um, in this area in the United States or actually outside of Asia. I so I'm, I am a little bit of a, of a strange bird. Almost Asian. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, but actually, I, I really have to second what Kwong said. Um, in my experience across Asia, and you're right, it's dozens of countries in Asia, um, there is a difference to protocols, but I will say a caveat to that from my experience is that what's happening with the different generations. So my generation, I'm a middle-aged person. Um, I mean, I am actually am very, I'm very focused on, um, you, know, defer, you, know, you know, respecting my seniors and just the protocols. But the, the millennials I work with, the younger folks, it doesn't matter if they're Asian or not. They are just, they are much more informal than me. Uh, they're very direct. They're just like, let's get this done. 
Um, so that's actually been a big adjustment for me um, is, is working with the next. And I love it. I, I'm such a believer in intergenerational work um, because we really bring such different in, uh, perspectives and different energies. Um, and it is learning. I mean, the, the other big thing I would say, I mean, actually, I think Kwong just hit the nail on the head. So Kwong, man, you, you just you just nailed it. Um, translation issues around language, equity, um, you know, power dynamics. Um, I think another another issue is having the having the patience to take a long term view. Um, you know, it's that I do have a corporate background once upon a time and it was those quarterly results, quarterly results, quarterly results. So even with funders, you know, how do you, together you create, um, you know, a, enough of, a, of a, a trusting relationship and agree on the principles of of the of the partnership together? So to kind of answer your question around enablers or prerequisites, I think, um, I, I mean, I love the collective impact framework, but I think there also has to be an agreement on, on core values and core principles for, the, for all of the collaborators. And that's not just with, say, the community, um, you know, making sure that they have a voice. It's actually across the partners themselves. So making sure that there's mutual benefit and and net value to all. So, so it's that value proposition of what each partner and each actor, I should say, is putting in, but also what are they receiving and what we each value is going to be uh, possibly very different. What I value might and what incentivizes me could be very different from uh, the four of you, say, if you're my partner sitting on that stage. Um, I think folk, and empathy, Jeho said earlier about trust, building trust and being transparent and and putting yourself in the other people's shoes um, and, and really uh, can be intentionally empathetic. Um, yeah, and then I think, I think uh, finally, it, it is coming back to um, that backbone um, and the value of the backbone. I think one of the challenges is that we all have what we call a back table, you know, so any of our organizations, we've got, whether it's finance or, or the big boss or whomever it is behind us, um, if that shifts, you know, if you lose your executive sponsor or something happens and, and, and you lose, you know, your, your back table and the support you have um, that, that, that are the components of that backbone, that's where as a collective, can you get through times like that when things will change and the unexpected, um, you know, will happen. So I guess those would just be a couple of my thoughts off the top of my head. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting that like Kang and Christy, both of you like mentioned that the uh, that uh, the translating language uh, between like different for different you know, stakeholders are quite challenging, right? So I just from now on I just want to hear from Jeho's opinions because he's the one uh, panelist uh, from the corporate side, right? So um, so Hyundai, as Hyundai's uh, groups uh, mentioned here, like he, they have been involved in, in different collective impact in Korea already, many, many years, right? They're supporting uh, social enterprises and uh, here in Korea, but right now they are, you know, expanded their regions, you know, uh, abroad, like Vietnam this time. And, and you, you, you know, try to, you know, um, initiate your collective uh, impact uh, in Vietnam, in different countries. And this is a cross-border and plus closed sector collaborations. And, and I think, I assume that there's a, lots of challenging uh, challenges uh, in the process. So I just want to ask you, what were the you know, key major challenges that you were facing as a corporation? And how did you overcome them? So I just want to ask that question first. I think that if we want to create a uh, collective impact, uh, we should have to match our respective interests. The interests of corporations and non-profit organizations are totally different. So in the non-profit perspective, the reason of why we have to do is important. Uh, but in the corporate view, it is not easy to gain approval internally without the explanation of what to do with it. So it is important to sharing what each other's interest from the first stage in building our partnership. So I think that the partnership is not just about selecting an agency, but about sharing our philosophy and soul. So it's like a marriage, uh, as you know, it takes a lot of effort to sustain a happy marriage life. 
So it is essential that uh, all participants in the collective impact system have a strong personal relationship uh, that's uh, based on mutual trust and sometimes mutual law to overcome our differences. This is my answer. It's not easy, but we have to do that to make a greater impact than just doing by ourselves. So the answer is not decided, but Eric told us that we have to uh, do the five principles of collective impact, but over there and beneath the five principles, our human effort is needed to achieve that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Jeho. Um, so, so we are facing the the next normal era, right? So I uh, want to again like to Jeho, but uh, the role of uh, because like we are facing the new world right now, and then I think uh, I think very interesting because the Hyundai Group uh, itself is uh, leading the, this collective impact initiative, um, and I think it's really uh, you're making of really good cases here in Korea and in 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 outside of Korea as well. So. Do you see that the, the, the role of the corporation will be different, uh, will be transformed uh, in the next normal era? How do you expect? When it comes to the next normal, we should work together to solve a social problem. And as you know, our social problems are getting serious and getting complicated. So it's difficult to solve these problems only by one corporate or one non-profit organization. So cross-sector cooperation is needed to efficiently solve complex social problems. For example, the response of Korea society to the COVID-19 shows how cross-sector cooperation is important to solve complex social problems such as Corona. And the Korean government also did a good job, but the participant of all social members, all society members, including uh, medical company that developed and distributed their diagnostic kits from the early stage of Corona, and donations from large corporations such as Samsung and Hyundai, and the activities of disaster-related organizations, and the dedication of a medical community was able to successfully respond to COVID-19 in Korea. So. I think that companies like Hyundai need to evolve into collective friendly organizations for create our society more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Um, this time, this, I'd like to ask a question to Kyung Sang. Uh, so as an impact investor, so I mean, I think you mentioned that uh, you are, you'll be leading the impact transition of corporations and uh, you said that uh, you know in the collective impact uh, framework, you'll be the like taking a role as a backbone organization. Then, could you please a uh, little bit more uh, elaborate more on that? How uh, your like collective impact initiative will look like, and do you expect to include other parties like impact startups or nonprofits? And, and how do you uh, you know really uh, implement your in collective impact initiative? Um, I believe. Well, actually, we are not leading their impact transformation. I'm more of a help them to lead the impact transforma uh, transformation. Yeah, I, I think that one of, one of the like, very important trend right now is a lot of the large corporations already need, the, uh, they already realize the importance of why they should be, uh, try to be much more sustainable. Now, if you talk to a lot of the leaders, especially when they become like the third or fourth generation leaders, they realize their like, like legacy businesses, it might not work anymore if they're working in, let's say, like sugar plastics and all this like polluting businesses and all that. So they are really trying to find and identify like what should be the next one. But for them, uh, in a way, they are way more knowledgeable and they have much more expertise in terms of like what they should do. They already identified like a bunch of different companies. Like, uh, for example, if you are uh, interested in this, like the lowering the carbon emission, and if you're an energy company, we talk to some of them, and they already know, like certain renewable energy is working in certain countries, and like even though now the lot of 
there's climate finance people, they're talking about the energy efficiency, but there's no company large enough for them to actually acquire. So in a way, they know much better than uh, much, uh, they know much better about the market than the impact people. But I guess their issue is they're more of a still um, uh, sort of ESG approach. So they're more of a like a negative screening. So they know they cannot do this and they know they should do this. But they like really, it's sort of having a hard time figuring out like what sh what's much more better aligned with their business model. I think this is where like social impact organizations comes in because we, uh, we've been doing this impact measurement uh, for a longer time. So we know which model is like the producing, like which kind of like positive social impact. So like if it's like energy or if it's like renewable, especially looking into solar, they should be much fitted to this business than that business. So I think this is ultimately what we are trying to do. I think we are trying to work. So as like the Sustainable Future Alliance, we are trying to work with social impact organizations to gather all the data for like each different social innovation models and which is a producing what kind of social innovation. And with that data, we are trying to work with the companies to basically like help them to figure out like what's going to be most optimized approach for their main business should be. I think uh, this is somewhat uh, led to like our conversation about how can he basically translate with other people. Uh, if your conversation order, if your dialogue is based upon, um, let's say, value or ethics, there should be certain trans, uh, translation issue, because like someone is uh, someone is reading this, this book, or and, or and someone is other other people are reading like more of a, other books. But if you are actually creating your dialogue based in, based on data, data is numbers, so it's really like it's going to be much easier for us to have the conversation based on data. It's going to be much easier for us to create a common ground on them and understand each other. So that kind of data-based impact common ground dialogue is something we are trying to achieve. Thank you. Um, so as we can see here, we are actually witnessing lots of um, um, collaboration and open innovation between the corporation and impact startups uh, in Asian region, I think. So here, um, I'd like to ask your like, advice or our opinions because you have been building an uh, impact ecosystem in Korea for uh, quite a long time. And um, if you look at the impact startups, when they are collaborating with uh, different sectors and for their collective impact initiative, for example, then um, what do you want to you know, recommend them to um, you know, foster or build, to build their capacity? What do they have to you know, um, you know, improve? Uh, I don't know. That's very difficult yeah. question. <laughs> uh, actually, I, uh, this is not my idea. Actually, I heard this from uh, someone else two days ago, and then I think his advice uh, was very clear. The the one thing is basically we cannot demonize the large corporation. That's one of the people, the social impact organization, falls a lot that the large corporation. Oh, they only know about the money. They don't really care about the social impact. This is social impact washing. Blah blah blah. You cannot expect the other people to work with you when you are actively demonizing the other counterparts and then you are basically having this moral high ground and then like telling the people like you should do this or that. You should really try to understand like what is their motivation from the top level to the, the, the implementation level. Like, 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 uh, like you said before, like if this is like quarterly basis, uh, the review, then we should respect that as well. Like how can he create this like small steps to implement this social impact strategy so they can actually follow up with this. Um, and I think this understanding why and uh, why and how they're engaging with the social impact. I mean, like as a social impact uh, organization, we should really understand how the larger corporation people works. We need to understand that. And the second thing is, Sometimes the social impact organization, since we, since this whole social impact issue or the solving the social problem is such an important issue for us, and then this is something we are good at, sometimes we already created all the vision and design and everything, and then we just ask like large corporation, you should just implement this or just give us the money and we'll do the work. Then you are sort of taking away their ownership from these problems. I think uh, it's always very important that taking your time and then having a lot of conversation with the large corporation partners and then like help them to feel the ownership with this issue. And even though like you, you can already know everything and then like it's, it, maybe it'll take more time for you to educate your counterparts. 
But once they actually learn everything by themselves, so that once they are the one who's bringing ideas to the table, they will feel much more stronger engagement. And then actually they're going to own the, uh, this project with you and then they're going to appreciate that. So I think these two, that one, trying to understand their motivation and second is trying to allow them to have much more ownership with the project. That's the best way to deal with the large corporation from the social impact, uh, impact organization perspective. Thank you so much. That was very insightful uh, for me. And um, so, so on a different, slightly different note, that I, as a um, you know manager at ABPN in Korea, and sometimes, I mean, even uh, at NISC, you know, uh, where I work, is uh, we've been doing lots of uh, different um, you know international development projects and uh, funded by Koika and. But uh, in reality, uh, for us, it's quite difficult to find the right partner for this type of cross-border projects many times. And I feel that uh, compared to other countries, I mean, this is a, in the, a story about Korea, but um, the order resources and the projects quite focused on uh, in Korea and domestic market. And here, I just want to ask uh, the Kwang's opinion because you've been working uh, with different aid agency, right? And and they are reaching out to uh, different countries. And now you are, you know, residing in Korea and working for Korean office and Korea society. And now, how do you feel? How can we, you know, um, bring more, using more resources, use more resources for like cross-border products projects? And how can we, you know? utilize our resources uh, for that. Do you have any idea? Um, that's a very, very important question. In terms of why there is not a sufficient collaboration and funding across Asia uh, from Korea, uh, I don't know all the reasons. I, um, you know, I, I'm hearing that because there's ample local funding, like national funding, there's not a lot of incentives to go out. Um, there's language barriers. Uh, there are lots of different issues that we can go on and on. I also sense there is a bit of over-reliance on the government to start these programs and fund these programs. I think government does has an important role in, in catalyzing and helping. But it's really, the, I think, the greatest opportunity, especially the younger generation um, here that's in, in this audience, um, is is uh, with the private sector, the private initiatives. And when I say private sector, I mean companies, NGO, civil society, academia. I think the, that grassroots private orientation uh, is the, where the opportunities are. We've launched several uh, regional uh, networks and international networks in, involving Silicon Valley and Asia. It's called Silicon Valley Business Forum. We just started in September, an online forum of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs in, in Korea and Asia. Um, so there are, and AVPN is doing good things as well. So there are like good examples of what we can do. Um, we've been working with uh, family offices in Asia and in Europe, in North America. They are much more creative and international. And so I think uh, if, if there is a groups of funders who can provide you funding and expertise uh, in certain areas, I think that that could be really good partners to launch new initiatives. Thank you very much. So, as we are reaching out to our closing time, so I think we need to uh, like to deal with our main um, questions here. Like, how should the Asian impact ecosystem change, adapt for the next to new normal, uh, and to expand the positive impacts of collective uh, collective impact initiative? So uh, I just uh, want to ask, raise a question to Christy. So you introduced many insightful cases that shows that Asia impact ecosystem is actively growing, right? And they're trying to be adaptive to the pandemic. Um, I just want to ask, this, these are all good cases uh, that you shared, uh, which is very insightful, but um, could you give us any examples where collective impact is not very working well? And what was the reason, do you think? And to minimize this negative impact and to maximize the positive of collective impact, how how what kind of efforts should ecosystem player should you know make? And do you have any any idea for this? Yeah, actually, I mean, that would be a. 
I, I could I could spend the rest of the afternoon telling you all of my failure stories, you know, and all of the times because those are uh, in abundance, right? Um, and so I guess instead of specific specifying one specific example, I think it's what what you really have to watch out for, and it's it's really st it's building on um, what the other said, and I think what um, Kyung Sun said about don't demonize. Um, any one stakeholder, whether it's a corporate or a government or anyone else, we all have something to contribute. I mean, you know, it's it goes without saying that that our communities, um, our problems are so complex and so huge. There is simply uh, most of them cannot be solved by any by any one of us alone. So I don't see this as a competition, but it takes a lot of intentionality to really find that sweet spot um, to to um, to really provide a safe space where each partner, each stakeholder can actually tap what they're really good at. They share what they're good at, what they have to offer. I mean, it, it could be funding if you're a corporate, but it could be access to a community or, or decades of trusted relationships at a community level with community leaders if you're a small NGO, you know, and, and everything in, believe, in between. Um, I would say just some of from my experience on, on the, the, uh, the collective action efforts, the partnerships that I've been involved with over the decades, uh, decades, two last two decades. Um, one is that um, the, the whether it's the funder or the partners or the, 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 the biggest partner just wants results too quickly. Um, you need to take time to build that foundation um, and, and to spend time really anchoring, get your baseline, um, you know, get your anchored, you know, your, your plat, your, your foundation in place um, and have the patience um, to invest in that. Um, again, I mentioned already about making sure you, for each organization, that you've got your backbone, your back table, um, the commitment in place, so that as things change and adapt, um, you know things don't fall apart. Um, I think we've, we've mentioned um, the importance of co-creation, um, that everybody pools their unique. Uh, resources, their unique contribution, and those are honored and respected by the different actors um, so that everyone, uh, you know, it's not necessarily equal, but it's equitable, as I think all of us have mentioned, that that each partner has an equal right to a seat at the table. Um, yeah, so I, I think um, I think this is the way, I, th I think we have no choice. I think this is a uh, collective act impact model um, and, and, you know, slight variations thereof. I just think it's it makes common sense. It's hard work. It requires intentionality and a lot of energy. Um, but I think it's the way. I definitely think it's the way forward. Thank you so much. So uh, this will be uh, my last question to all the panelists. So, um, so everybody said this is the, uh, the you know new uh, you know era, and we are going through the paradigm shift, and and we are you know going through a whole different world right now, and. And for the you know impact ecosystem players, uh, like, I mean, do you have any? Uh, could you share any like advice or tips and or recommendation how to cope with this situation? Uh, and do you see? Do you have to see this as a ch challenge or opportunity? And as a you know uh, represent as a representative of each different you know corporation for these uh, sessions, I mean, it would be very helpful for all the you know, audience and all the impact ecosystem players uh, you know, for you to share uh, some of the insights and knowledge. So, kyung -san, could you start first? I believe this is aligned with like what I said before. And now, in this era of the new normal, uh, it is evident that social impact become like much more important and then there's gonna be much more resources coming into this area and much more like until now considered as for profit money is moving into this area as well for like healthcare, the, the Green New Deal, the climate change and all that. That means uh, the market is expanding and there's going to be much more expectation. And that means like as any social, uh, social impact uh, people, like we should ask ourselves that very difficult question. Are we the most optimized organization? Are we using the resource the most efficient and effective way? And it, and, and it, if we are, then how? Like, do do we have the data to prove that? And if we are not the most optimized one, like, then we should ask ourselves, why do we even exist? Because like now, because of the COVID, because of the climate change, because of everything, resources is limited and time is limited for the humanity. Uh, humanity. 
And if you're not the most optimized one, like we should really ask ourselves why we are doing everything. Thank you. So, Joe. Well, actually, I'm working for profit-oriented company, but I think that we needed to consider more uh, smarter way to using our money for society. So, just giving donation is not enough now. So, um, it's important to find out the proper social innovator and social innovation company who are working with big corporations such as Hyundai and Samsung and SK. So, this kind of conversation is very important for us to know what the other organization are doing. So it's a kind of a chance to what we are doing to give you and what to know you what we are doing here in this corporation conference. So uh, I think that if we're working together, uh, we can make it a better society for our future generation. So and this is a very good opportunity for me. Thank you for having me here today. My suggestion is we should clone all of the panelists and multiply them and send them to Asia. I think that would really help uh, the Asia to become a better place. Um, besides that, COVID-19 specifically has accelerated the inequality trends, a lot of the world global trends, um, uh, the, the minorities, the... Uh, um, so it's, it's really accelerated a lot of the, the polarization, the trade barriers, the closing, the lack of cooperation. So I think uh, these collective impact approaches are uniquely needed in times like this. And this is the time I think we should really double down on and finding greater ways to operate uh, across, the, across the region. Thank you. So, Christy? Could you share your last word? Yeah, thanks. Um, Actually, I'm, I'm going to share two really quick last words, just because I get to okay, last here. Um, yeah, really quick. Um, so actually, one is I'm reminded of a, of a statement I read uh, by a company called SG Innovate, which is a, a tech, can they connect, uh, they're part of this ecosystem, they connect tech companies and others. Um, but they said that, you know, COVID, the, the pandemic is an important reminder of the long-term importance of investing in and building human capital. So it's easy to think just about finding financial capital, but there's so many different kinds of capitals, right? Social capital, uh, human capital, health, knowledge, capabilities, skills, and resilience are, are a few of the things that they mentioned. And all of these are critical to ensuring that we all, each one of us, regardless of where we are, what we're doing, has the opportunity to reach um, our full potential. And so as I, as I think about that, something I'm really focused on right now is making sure that as the, as the earth has kind of taken a, a breath, uh, I think is breathing right in the last six seven months as things have kind of come to a uh, come to a well, come to a stop in many cases and slowed down as the whole earth is taking a breath. I think we need to as well. Um, it's kind of slowing down to to move fast, slowing down to speed up, and just it's really important to take a deep breath, take a time out, um, and and keep keep an eye on one another, keep an eye on your teams, keep an eye on your colleagues, keep an eye on your family, um, and then catch your breath and then dig back in working collectively together to create a multiplier effect of, of positive social change in the lives of people around the region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. And, um, you know, we are, it's true that we're, we're you know, going through a very difficult momentum and challenging time. But indeed, I, as a, you know, uh, one of um, ecosystem play, impact ecosystem players, I feel that, you know, COVID-19 actually didn't really influence uh, a lot uh, regarding our, you know, you know, initiative and passion. I mean, it become more, I think, vibrant as uh, Chris is that. I mean, through virtually, you know, we can do, you know, a lot of things actually. So uh, even though we cannot meet uh, our audience in person this time, but I think it's uh, such a meaningful time to share all our works to the broader community through virtu I mean, virtually. So it was so wonderful and privileged to be a moderator here. And thank you all for today. And hope to hope all of you enjoy the rest of our conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>